Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another fantastic WorkEase webinar. Today, we're talking about building an HVAC business to sell. Um, I want to make sure everyone can hear me. So if you can just say hi in the chat or just tell us where you're from, uh, that would be great. Just so I know who, who's here and you guys can hear us. We'll give it another 30 seconds or so for uh, people to funnel in here. I want to make sure people see us. Patrick, how are you today? I'm doing fantastic, Wes. I really appreciate you having me on here today. Yeah, we're, we're excited for this one. And as a, as a reminder, just before we get into it all, um, we are uh, recording this and this will be available on WorkEase's website afterwards, and you can also find it, uh, a recording of it using the same link that you are using today. Um, okay, let's just kind of get started here. So as I said, today's topic, uh, building an HVAC business to sell. We have a fantastic guest speaker today. Uh, I'll introduce him, or I'll let him introduce himself in a second, but. I'm your moderator today, Wes Friednash over at Workies. And today we have Patrick Lang. He is awesome. He's been in the HVAC uh, industry for a very long time. So again, I'll let him introduce himself in a second, but just to give a uh, high level overview of the agenda today, we're gonna go into Patrick, his story of it. We're gonna talk then a little bit about what it takes to build a business to a heating and air business to sell. We'll jump into some Q and A and then we'll get into like some final words, how to get in touch with Patrick and we'll leave, leave you on your way. So let's get into it. Patrick, tell the people who you are and let's hear a little bit about your story. Yeah, absolutely. So as the, as the slide mentions, I'm a business broker who specializes in the sale of heating and air companies. I've been a, a business broker for a number of years. So I've owned multiple different businesses, one of which was a heating and air company. Um, I uh, sold that business to my son. Uh, I'm actually in his office, uh, in his building where he runs his heating and air company out of my office. Is still in his office. I'm around it. I'm around the industry all day, every day, not only in the companies that I help people buy and sell, but uh, from a family standpoint, uh, if I walked outside my door right now, there'd be ductwork stacked up and mini splits ready to be installed and things going on right outside. So, I've been a broker for years, bought a heating and air company a little over eight years ago. I ran it for two years. And when I, um, I realized that I didn't belong running a heating and air company and I missed the brokerage world and went to sell my business and we were a smaller company and I couldn't find anybody who could help me and give me reliable information about selling a, a smaller size heating and air company. And so I thought, well, if, if I'm in the industry and I can't figure out any information about it, imagine somebody who knows nothing about business brokerage. There's probably, there's probably a lot of people looking for information. So at that point in time, I got rid of all my other listings that I had um, and just focused on heating and air. I'm based in Florida. Um, and so initially I started just in Florida, then I sold a company in Georgia, then the Carolinas, and next thing you know, we're nationwide. Um, I've been fortunate um, the last six years to sell 120 heating and air companies. So I typically average 20 a year this year. We'll have done a little bit more by the end of the year. And, um, and so that's a, a little bit about me and, and kind of what we do. Awesome. Thanks uh, for that background here. Um, I, Trevor, thanks. I, I appreciate you confirming we can hear you. Welcome to the, uh, welcome to the webinar. So let, let's get into it. Uh, today we're talking about be, be, uh, building a heating and air business to sell. So we're going to focus on four things here, uh, four tips, I guess, that you can strive for to get your business to sell. Um, I'm going to put a poll out there. I, we're just curious if you've ever thought about selling your business. Um, so I'm going to publish a few polls. So one is going to be yes or no. And then the second one if you have thought about selling your business, how long until you are at that point? Um, again, we're just kind of curious uh, about where you're thinking today. The first topic that we're going to talk about is uh, in terms of the HVAC space, building a service, building a business on service and repair. So 
Patrick, can you talk about this, what it means, um, and go into it a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So just let me kind of back up a little bit for a second, Wes. So the four things we're going to talk about today are not earth-shattering. They're not groundbreaking. They're kind of basic information. But so many people, I think, spend all this time chasing all these shiny objects. And the reality is that if you focus on these four things as you're building your business, I can guarantee you that you'd be able to sell your business for more money than if you didn't. So, so once again, these are not things you probably have not heard of. You've heard people talking about them, different ideas, but I think so many times people get lost chasing the shiny nickel instead of focusing on a plan. So what I want to talk about today is kind of four things you can do right away that you can implement in your business starting now or focus on your business now that will help grow the value of the business. First thing, once as Wes mentioned, is a business built on service and repair. Buyers love consistency of income. So many people, if you're on Facebook and LinkedIn and all these social media groups, you hear all these guys bragging about all these change outs and what they're making on this and what they're making on that. And reality is when a buyer looks at your business, they're looking for consistency. They're, they love long-term business, long-term employees, people that have been there. So when they come in and buy the business, that it's not a big disruption, that it's not somebody who's only worked there a few months, that all the customers are new. It's just a big marketing machine. They love relationships. They love customers that have been there a long time. They love people who trust you, who welcome you into their home. That's often done through maintenance agreements and just general service and repair. So what they're not looking at buying is, is just box changers. You see a lot of companies out there that they don't have technicians. They have salesmen dressed as technicians and everybody gets a new unit. And that's the model they build their business after. And that's not really what these buyers are looking for in today's market. And if you put yourself in a buyer's shoes, it's understandable. You want relationships. You want long-term people. You want people who trust the brand because at the end of the day, they're buying two things. They're buying the brand and they're buying the employees that generate that revenue and, and, and are the behind the brand. So consistency in that care in that area is extremely key. Deep relationships are key. And they also like diversity in the income, indoor air quality, potentially um, other trades, whether it's plumbing, electrical. I see people now adding pest control, garage door repair, other things that are tying in, but a deeper share of wallet, and they like that as well. When it, it, so on the different industries or different trades you're talking about, um, you, you mentioned trades like plumbing and electrical. Does it make sense for everyone to add these trades? Absolutely not. So, so I see a lot of people who are struggling in the heating and airspace thinking that, oh, if I just add plumbing or electrical, it's going to make things better. The reality that, that anybody in the industry knows the biggest problem is, is finding quality help. And if you've got to find, if you're struggling to find quality heating and air guys, then you're going to struggle to find quality electricians and, and quality plumbers. It's really making your problem worse. So my advice is let's make sure you're maximizing your business. You have all of the, all of the systems in place that you're, you're running a fine tuned machine before you go creating other problems for yourself. So does it make sense for some people to do it? Absolutely does. If you have all the things in place, but to be still a small company and do it oftentimes creates more headaches, more problems, and, and ultimately leads to less income. So we got a question in there uh, from Amoth. Uh, he asked, how are franchises combining air and air plus plumbing? I, I don't know if this is something that I need him to expand a little bit on on the question, but can you talk about that, Patrick? Yeah, you see a lot of people adding multiple trades. And so I don't know what specifically his question is, like how are they doing it licensing or how are they successful with it or what are they doing marketing wise? So it's kind of challenging to answer that question. And certainly feel free to, to add some clarity in, in that question. I'm happy to answer it. I think there's different ways to go about doing different things. And I I see a lot of franchises that are that that have multiple trades and they're running them separately. So you'll see they have one franchise system that's plumbing and one franchise system that's electrical and one franchise system that's heating and air. Now, some owners buy all three franchises and do all three and some they run separately. So it, it appears that he's, he's typing a response to, to me bringing that up and maybe we'll be able to get a, 
a little clarity on what he's looking for, and I'm happy to answer that for him. Yeah, and I, as we wait for that, um, I, another question I had on the employee side, when a buyer is looking at acquiring something that has long-tenured employees, uh, what are people doing to attract and keep employees right now, especially in this market? So that's really, that's the number one complaint I hear when people call me about selling. You know, when I ask them why are you wanting to sell, many of them, it's because they've been struggling to keep employees and they're sick of the struggle. Um, so it's, um, it's challenging, um, for everyone. And, and, and I'll talk to people in Florida and try to call earlier today in Minnesota and one yesterday in California, it's not regional state specific. It's nationwide. Everybody's facing the same problems. The long-term solution I see for somebody running a successful company, what I've seen work the best is hiring for attitude and training for aptitude. So they're bringing people in that are good people and have the, the traits that they're looking for and they're teaching them the trade. Whether they're sending them to a school to learn that trade, like Ultimate Tech or one of these others, or if they're, they have a training system in-house, they're bringing, often bringing people in with no industry experience that may have some mechanical ability. I, I, one company in Minnesota I talked to, they only hire farmer kids. So kids that have spent their life working on a farm, they've worked long hours, they've, they've been in a field and had to fix things with duct tape and a screwdriver. I mean, they're somewhat mechanical and, and, and understand how to get by. And so hiring people like that with a good personality, because obviously we're in somebody's home. And, and it's a challenging environment to be in and making sure they have the ability to communicate and make people feel comfortable is a key thing. So that's the, that's the biggest thing I see happening because unfortunately, I think the industry is hurting itself from the employee side. And you go to bigger cities and you see them poaching people away from other companies and following guys to gas stations and offering them sign-on bonuses. And unfortunately, you're making that shiny nickel worse. And and, and now technicians are leaving because this company's got a shinier ladder or this company says you don't have to go in attics or this company says this. And, and a lot of it's just not possible. You're in the heating and air space. You're going to work in hot environments. You're going to work in attics. You're going to have days where it doesn't feel so good. And so I think we're making, I say we, I, I think a lot of people are making promises that they can't keep and people are leaving. And when I look at tenure, one of the first things I ask people when I'm talking about selling their company is kind of give me a list of your employees. How long have they been there? And you see six months, three months, five months, nine months. And I'm asking, are those guys new in the industry? No, they've been in the industry forever. They're just here. And so unfortunately, we often hire out of need, right? They'll have a great technician and it's 4th of July weekend and he quits. Phone's ringing off the hook. They need somebody to, they need a butt in a truck. So they go out and hire somebody who says the right things. They've been in the industry a long time. And boom, they put them in a truck. Well, six months later, he quits them too. And they realize that now they've got to spend the next six months going back and fixing everything that he didn't fix right. So I think, I think solving the problem ahead of time, planning for that, putting training systems in place is the best solution. And then I see uh, Amaf there uh, has, has answered his question, He's looking to become a semi-absentee franchisee in space. Is it a viable option? Yeah, I think it is. Um, I, I sell a lot of companies to a lot of people who have no, don't necessarily have industry experience, but they've got great business experience. Um, and so I think surrounding yourself with the people that have the knowledge that you don't have, I think it's absolutely doable. So I, and I don't know you or your experience or, um, so I'm making a blanket statement. Um, but it definitely, it, it, it is a doable option. Um, all right. We just got another question. I think that question is good to, I mean, you tell me we could do this now or we could wait till the Q and a, I think that's a really good question to do at the Q and a part. Uh, I'm fine. Whatever you, whatever you prefer. I'm good. Yeah. We can wait till Q and a. Um, okay. That's great. Yeah. Or, and that's a great question. We'll, we'll do it, um, at the Q and a, we, we have a few more slides and then we'll, we'll answer that one. So the second topic here is, uh, getting out of the van. So Patrick, can you tell us a little bit what you mean by getting out of the van and how this attracts uh, sellers? Or yeah, absolutely. Buyers, sorry. No, no, absolutely. So I, I think a lot of people, many of, the, many of the sellers I come across, they were technicians turned business owners, right? They didn't like their boss, went and got their own license, started their own business. Incredible at indoor air quality. No more about duct design and airflow than anybody in the country. Don't often know a ton about business. 
So they won't get out of their own way. They only can run so many service calls. And as a result, their business is capped because if, if they're the number one tech, if they're the number one salesperson, if they're the number one bookkeeper, if they're the number one, number one, number one of that, oftentimes one, they don't really have a business. They have a high paying job and, and I'm okay with that. I'm not saying that you shouldn't, that, that you need to grow a big business. And that's one of the things that, that, that I, when I get opportunities to speak at places I talk about, I'm not saying building a big business to sell is the answer for everybody. There's a lot of people who are themselves and a helper making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. And I'm not here to say that's the wrong approach. I mean, I think whatever makes a fit for you is what you should do. What I'm talking about today is if the goal is to build a business for maximum value, you being in the field is slowing down that growth. So because not only you only can run so many service calls, but when it's time to sell, a buyer's gonna look at that scenario and say, now I've got to replace the number one technician I've got to replace the number one salesperson and I've got to replace the number one office staff. So they'll beat you up on price because now they've got to pay people to do all the work you're doing. Where if you already have those people in place, when you step out of the business, it doesn't leave a, leave a huge void and you're able to get a higher dollar figure for that. Um, how, how do you see people make the transition to get out of the van? So it's a process. Um, you know, the biggest fear a lot of times is for them to get out is if I'm hiring somebody, one, finding somebody to hire, two, if they hire somebody, they've got to trust them. And that's often the biggest struggle that they run into is that they are so focused on providing great quality work that they forget about the business side. And so it's always about indoor air quality and fixing equipment the best way and often being the least expensive and helping the home around that they're, they're not looking at the business side. So they've got to trust that person is going to do a good enough job to, to represent their name out in the field. And, and then the third part of that is the scary part is are they going to have enough work for them? You know, they're taking on somebody who's got a feed a family potentially pay their own bills. Are they going to have enough work? And so oftentimes one of the best ways to begin that process is through a maintenance agreement program. You know, bringing in somebody younger and having them starting to run maintenances where it's not necessarily full on repair work and diagnostic work. It's a maintenance program and cleaning coils and checking capacitors and doing that type of stuff. So they're learning. And as they're learning, then they can slowly be taking some of the work off of that owner's plate and then just repeat that process over and over. Oh, that's great. Um, we had another question come in about uh, seeing elderly or retiring owners of home services businesses selling their business. Do you see them selling their business more often? Yeah, so the bulk of the, my sellers are retiring owners. You know, I know there's some young people in the industry who've built great businesses and are selling them, you know, oftentimes to private equity to, to potentially partnering with them. A lot of my sellers are People who have been in the business 20, 25 years, and they're just done. They've done a great job taking care of the community, taking care of the employees, taking care of their customers, and they don't have any kids that want to take it over. And so the ultimate, the, the next step is to sell to somebody different. So th there's definitely a lot of those hitting the marketplace because you look at that age, you, know, you talk about the baby boomers that are moving into retirement and all the numbers that come with that. And I think that's a reality. Um. Awesome. All right. I, let's, I think we're ready for the next topic, which is uh, number three, your business is not your personal checking account. I'm going to pass it back to you to go through this a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something that I, I, I deal with, I guess is a good term a lot. Uh, and I've been self-employed since I was 20 years old. So I understand running a business to minimize taxes, but there's a difference between running a business to minimize taxes and running a business that you want to sell for top dollar because it's two different it's two different metrics right if many people when i get to them when i talk about their business tell me about your business oh we do a million and a half in sales fantastic what are you making from an income standpoint oh we're making two hundred thousand dollars a year fantastic and then i see their tax returns it looks like a completely different company so there it shows eight hundred thousand dollars in sales on their tax return and they're losing money when you look at the bottom line. And so when I talk to them, they say, well, yeah, I don't want to pay taxes. Well, if you put yourself on a buyer's shoes, that buyer's buying income. 
And if you can't prove the income, it's going to be challenging for them to do it. Second part of that is many buyers today are using bank financing. Well, if you can't go to a bank with a, a business you're buying and a tax return that shows them they're losing money and expect them to loan money. So if you're being creative in your accounting and you're doing everything you can to minimize your taxes, you have to understand that one, you're going to eliminate, let's call it 25 to 35% of the buyer pool that was planning on using financing. Those people are automatically eliminated from buying your business because they can't. Second thing is you're not going to get top dollar because if, if it's like where's Waldo going through your taxes and spreadsheets trying to find out what's business expense, what's personal expense, they're not going to pay you top dollar for that. The third thing here, and that's what we talk about on the slide here, is doing some quick math. Let's assume you have $100,000 of profit that you're going to you're going to reclassify as cost of goods. So personal expenses, whatever it may be, you're going to hide that in the business. Let's assume you're in the highest tax bracket, 37%. So by doing that, you save $37,000 in taxes. Well, now let's assume you're going to market and you showed that profit in your business, paid the taxes on it, paid that $37,000 in taxes and went to market. And we're able to get you, let's assume only a two and a half times, which you should be able to do better than a two and a half time multiple. So that would translate to $250,000 of extra selling price for you. So by hiding the money and in essence cheating on taxes, <laughs> It costs you an extra $213,000. That's real spendable money. And so that's something that people don't think about. They always think about saving taxes, saving taxes, saving taxes. Well, if you're building to sell, you need to show as much as you can. There's a joke in the industry and it says you can't get paid to steal twice. You can't steal from the federal government and expect somebody else to pay you for that. If you put yourself in a buyer's shoes, if you came to me, Wes, and said, hey, I'm I've been around these heating and air companies. I want to buy one. And I say, man, I've got this great company for you doing $2 million in sales. They're making $300,000 a year. They're asking a million and a half for the business. And I show you the books and the books show them losing money every year. You look at me like I've got two heads. Why in the world would I want to write a million and a half dollar check for a business that's losing money? It just doesn't make sense. So so stop running everything through the business if the ultimate goal is to sell. Typically, a buyer is going to look back at three years of finances. So many people will come to me and say, okay, well, just this year, I'm going to pay taxes on it. What well, makes you even look worse? Because then how does the buyer really believe what numbers are accurate if one year you happen to pay taxes on money? So it, it makes a buyer more concerned. And here's the reality as well. If you're creative in your accounting, and the ultimate, the ultimate penalty for cheating on your taxes is jail. So if you're willing to take that risk, how do I as a buyer, who well, I have no way to penalize you, how can I trust you? If you're willing to, to risk going to jail for it, how can I know that the numbers you're giving me is, are accurate? So as we get into a more competitive environment from a selling standpoint, you have to understand that you don't want to get the odds stacked against you. Having everything run through your business is one of the ways to get those odds stacked against you. So, I, I mean, a good follow-up question I have after hearing a little bit about that is uh, it, it, if someone envisions selling, I mean, even if they don't envision selling, how important is record keeping in, in this mix here? And then uh, a follow-up question I have is when it comes to software like CRMs, how important is that as well? So, so the answer on both of those is extremely, um, you know, clean books and records. I can tell you as a, as your broker, I can get you a higher selling price if the books are clean. If I can hand somebody a tax return and say, Hey, here's what they're making. Here's proof of it. Here's the last three years of it versus giving them a spreadsheet where they're paying for their ex-girlfriend's condo and they're paying for all this stuff and calling it cost of goods. I can promise you the clean tax return is going to get a higher multiple. Second thing is a CRM like WorkEase and others that are on the market. Absolutely, it's helpful because if a buyer can come in and say, run me this report, give me this number, give me this data. Part of what they're buying is the historical information on your customers. Well, if you hand them a file cabinet with 20 years worth of slips of paper in there that they've got to sort through, it's challenging for them to even know what they're buying. If you can give them access to your CRM, 
and say, what report do you need to run? Here's the customer's data. Here's the customer's equipment. Here's the last time we were there. Here's what we charged them. Here's what was wrong. Here's the serial number. Here's the model number. If you have all that stuff at, at, at a click of a button, it makes a huge difference from the customer standpoint. Definitely. Um, we have, we have like three questions that came in while we were on this uh, topic. Uh, yes. The first was from Andrew here. He said, has anyone created a program slash book for us who want to scale something that lays out six months, one year, five year uh, process to follow for HVAC? So there's lots of co coaching organizations that has things similar to that. Um, that has, I don't know that they have a, here's a six month if you want to sell a one year, if you want to sell, um, I offer, uh, people to do valuations now and, and we work on these things. I'm not a coach or consultant. I don't get paid to do it, but you know, they'll come to me and say, here's where I'm at now. And I'll say, okay, you need to focus on this, this, and this, and here's why. And then let's come back to me in six months. So we have something like that. But there's lots of coaching organizations out there that can design specific systems to do that. Um, and then, then Amoth asked, do the back to his elderly owners, do they offer self financing options? So the, you know, historically they did. Here the last few years has been challenging getting the seller to offer financing. And, and put yourself in the seller's shoes. So the, the benefit and the curse of a heating and air business is they typically have low assets. You could generate $5 million of revenue with two hundred dollars to $300,000 of assets. So if they sell the business to you, a complete stranger, who oftentimes has no industry experience, they're betting their retirement on you, somebody who they don't know. And if you don't pay them, they get their business back and some used vans back which did they get a business back they didn't want to begin with because that's why they were selling. So it's, it's a challenging ask, especially with all the buyer interest in the market. When there's so many cash buyers or buyers who are eligible to get financing out there, it's really hard to get somebody to consider seller financing, at least a large portion. Now getting somebody to hold 10%, potentially 20% is not a big deal but getting them to hold a bigger percent in today's market when once again, you're a complete stranger um, with very little collateral within the business. It's, it's challenging to get somebody to do that right now. And then let's do one more question and move on to the next uh, slide. And then we'll circle back to the two questions that just came up, but uh, how important, so Daniel had a question about how important is it to show three strong years in comparison to last strong year, and it, it's in relation to a, a huge jump in year three when it comes to profit. Uh, would the buyer care or be scared of such a big jump? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, it's doable. We sell a lot of companies that had great years, all their ducks lined up in a row, certain things happen, um, but it's much harder. And, and putting yourself in a buyer's shoes once again, was it a fluke year? That's what they're looking at. They're looking at consistency and they'd rather see slow, consistent growth over the years instead of one big spike. Because then is that one big spike, is it caused by you got great at marketing? So if somebody else out marketed you, those customers would go someplace else kind of thing. So consistency is better. Can it be sold with a spike? Absolutely, but oftentimes they'll weight it. So they'll apply the most weight to the most recent year then to the second year, then to the third year. Great. Um, all right, let's go to our fourth topic and then we will have time to circle back to some of these other questions. So number four, stay away from new construction. Why? Yeah, this is, let's let's this hear is, about this. <laughs> this is something I start a lot of fights with. So um, I am not saying that New construction is not profitable. I'm not saying if your company focuses on new construction, you're not making money because I've met a lot of people who've made a lot of money in the new construction. And the reality is everywhere you go, there's construction taking place and somebody's got to do the work. So the work is there and, um, and you can make money at it. What I'm talking about in these four items is what a buyer's looking for. And buyers are scared to death of new construction for multiple reasons. One, most general contractors are not loyal. If they are loyal, they're loyal to you as the seller. And the minute you walk out the door, the loyalty leads with you. Secondary, they keep talking about a, a slowdown in the economy, a potential recession. What's taking place? Typically, new construction gets slaughtered. 
I've met a lot of people who had 60 employees in 2004 and five employees in 2008 because they did new construction and they got slaughtered. They didn't get paid. They had to file bankruptcy. All sorts of horrible things happened when that the economic slowdown happened. So once again, I'm not saying that you can't make money doing it. I'm saying buyers don't like it. Third thing on here is most banks don't like to lend on it. Most lenders, if you do more than 20% of your business in new construction, you can't get an SBA loan. It's the, the banks are scared to death of it as well because they know one downturn in the economy, one downturn on that on that uh, contractor's business, and you could not get paid. And as a result, they don't get paid. So staying away from new construction, it's often a race to the bottom. It's everybody competing on price, and it's nickels and dimes and nickels and dimes. And long term, you end up losing. You're better being diversified in a service repair replacement business model. And that's what will pay the highest dollar figure when it's time to sell. So, I, I mean, my question that I would have is, is if you have a business where you're doing a lot of construction, how hard is it to walk away from that income? Because I'm assuming you can't just walk away from that income. What would, what would you recommend doing? Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't walk away from that, right? You, you've got employees, you've got bills to pay. You want the business to stay consistent. I would start replacing it. So slowly taking on less, and that's back to the maintenance agreement division. And we could have an entire, uh, an entire webinar on maintenance agreements and why I think they work and why it's a, a good idea to be doing them. Um, but but in, implementing a maintenance program will allow you to generate that revenue that you're slowly walking away from, depending on what percentage of your revenue comes from the construction. You need a plan in place. You're not going to walk away cold turkey because of the income and you'd lose the employees. And you, you're going to want to train your employees from doing new construction to do service and traditional uh, repair replacement. And that's going to take time as well. And so putting a system in place to slowly replace it. And where I've seen that happen oftentimes is as that, that shift happens from construction uh, to service, Oftentimes, the company doesn't grow. So their gross sales are not growing. They're focusing more on replacing that other work with the service repair replacement work. And normally, the business is becoming more profitable through that process. So even though the, the top line is staying here, that bottom line ends up increasing as it's becoming more profitable. So I wouldn't walk away from it cold turkey. I put a system in place to slowly replace it. Um. Awesome. So I think we have a bunch of questions that we need to get to. Um, I let's. I think let's get into them. I, I want to get to. I, th I think Oren had a question a while ago. Uh, how do you typically appraise a company? Is there a one formula fits all? No, absolutely not. So when we when you look at a multiple of so so businesses typically sell on a multiple of the net income, and you hear people talking about EBITDA and all these other all these other terms but it's the net income of the business and they'll sell for a multiple of that. And what that typically is, is three times, four times, five times, how many years is it going to take that buyer to pay that business back based on that multiple of net income? So that, that, that multiple is going to be a range. So a business your size could sell between a three and a five time range of that multiple. And then what has an impact? Are you closer to three or closer to five is going to be how profitable are you? What systems do you have in place? Do you have a CRM in place? How many maintenance agreements do you have in place? What exposure to new construction do you have? So on that range is going to dictate where you are. So typically the multiple is going to be based on size. And then where within that range on that multiple is going to be based on all those different factors that go into value in the business. So it's not a you're doing two million. It's automatically worth this. It's going to be you're doing $2 million, you're netting this, this percent of revenue comes from service and repair and replacement, this amount comes from new construction, we have a GM in place, or we have a service manager in place, we have X amount of maintenance agreements, we have 50 versus 500 or 5,000, so all of those things play into there, it's not a cookie cutter one size fits all. So the next question here uh, from Jeff, it's a great question about um, commercial versus residential customers. So uh, Jeff's question is, for the sale of a larger HVAC business to one of the regional or national consolidators, are those buyers happy to see a mix of both commercial and residential customers? Or do they really want 
the company focused on residential or commercial or both? Yeah. So when you're looking at the big consolidators, they want one or the other. Now, there are other buyers out there who will buy something that's diversified and does some commercial and residential. But it, his question specifically talked about the consolidation and the consolidators out there. And they typically want one or the other. 100 percent service or, you know, 100 percent residential or 100 percent commercial. Now, in certain markets, they may have 10 or 15 percent commercial. They're a residential company and 10 or 15 percent is like commercial. It's going to be rooftop units or package units. Um, in, you know, it's, it's residential equipment in a commercial setting. And so that would still qualify as residential, but those bigger consolidators, they want clean one or the other. Um, okay. The next question is going to be, uh, uh, on the, from Amoth, uh, does a gap exist in the industry where elderly owners, with not the best performing business need to sell the business? And would this give someone the opportunity to turn around the business? Yeah, I think that exists. Um, you know, that's, that's the hardest seller for me to work with because they often have been self-employed for years and they don't take advice very well. And so somebody coming in from the outside saying, Hey, you've been doing it wrong and here's what you need to fix kind of a partnership mentality. It, that's a, it's a tough sale, I can tell you. I've seen I've seen a lot of buyers try to be that person um, and don't get a lot of traction um, because, as business owners, myself included, we believe we're the best at what we're doing, even if it's not producing the best results. So, so that opportunity does exist, um, but it's challenging to get to get that to happen. Okay, so. Another question here um, from Daniel. If you show proof that years one and two were years of growth, where you invested everything into vans, machine tools, hiring, et cetera, and built a great business, uh, 1% and two were only 200K profit, but year three was in two to three million profit, would they pay the multiple on, oh, sorry, it just disappeared, on the third year? profit or do you divide the three years? So it depends on who the buyer is. You know, my goal would be try to focus on the most recent, especially with a story like that, that we could tell um, that we can go to market and say, Hey, we had one time expenses here. The reality is growth is expensive. Um, and so many times I'll tell people that have been growing and growing is, Hey, if you're going to sell in a year, slow down the growth. Let's focus on profitability. Um, and that's a story that we can tell and they can prove. So if you're buying trucks, doing additional marketing and doing these additional training that are one-time expenses, some of that stuff in previous years would be able to add back or at least justify back to prove that their most recent year wasn't a fluke. It was what they're building towards. So it's doable, not as easy, um, not as clear cut, but certainly it is doable. Okay, we have wow, lots of, you guys are asking some great questions today. Lots of questions. Uh, Daniel asked, does the profit have to be pure profit you pay on taxes um, or is it the number prior to deprecation and such? So what we use is I use a figure called seller discretionary earnings or SDE. A lot of people you hear in the industry use EBITDA. So I'm going to give you my insider secret. I don't use EBITDA because EBITDA should be calculated very easily. Same way by everybody. Here's what I found. When 20 Harvard CPAs show up to do your due diligence, they all seem to calculate it differently. And then they tell you that your figure was wrong and they made an offer based on your EBITDA. So they'll say, we'll pay you a 5X multiple of EBITDA. Then they all come in, go through the books and say, hey, you said it was 500. It's really only 300. And here's why, why, why. And here's the way it's calculated. You're like a deer in headlights. And now their five time multiple went from two and a half million to a million dollars. And, and you're arguing with a Harvard CPA that you can calculate EBITDA better than they can. So I don't use EBITDA. I use seller discretionary earnings. And what seller discretionary earnings is company profit, plus we add back any interest, any depreciation, and owner's compensation. So if you take a W-2 paycheck, and then there's going to be some addbacks in there. And I don't have a problem doing addbacks that are provable. Personal health insurance, um, a car payment. Your wife drives a Porsche. 
Clearly, a Porsche is not needed in the business and it's a lease. We can add back that lease payment. So if there's things that we could easily prove that are add back, but what you don't want is you don't want a company doing $2 million a year that should be making $300,000, show on the tax return $20,000 of profit, and then you have to give them the $280,000 list of all these other things that it's paying for, because that's what makes it challenging. So it, it doesn't need to be just pure profit on the bottom line. It can be a combination of all those things as long as it's proven. All right, Mike asked a question in the questions tab. Um, I, I don't know if you have the answer to this, but um, back to kind of a discussion on valuations. Historically, um, if you want to have a $5 million valuation, uh, what, is, what KPI does a company need to hit to have that? Whew. Um, kind of... Uh... Um, kind of a, a hard, difficult question to answer and, and have it have it be accurate for everybody. So, so I'm going to be kind of vague intentionally, and I apologize for that, just because I don't want somebody to say, "Well, you told me every company doing this is going to sell for this." Um, so, so typically on a company that size, um, you know, you're looking at a company generating at least five million dollars a year in revenue. Um, and is, and is a very profitable company. So from a KPI standpoint, you know, typically the average companies we look at are generating around 15% to the bottom line. As that those sales go up from 5 million to 7 million to 10 million, typically that net income goes down from a percentage standpoint. And the reason is when you have a $2 million company and you hire another technician, you're automatically making more money. They're generating money to the bottom line. When you're an $8 million company and you have to bring in an operations manager to make sure everybody's going to the right place in the morning, they're not directly contributing to the bottom line. So their paycheck ends up being a draw on the company profit as opposed to increasing the company profit. So it's difficult to say this is what the exact figure needs to be, but it's often hard to sell a company for greater than one times gross. You can do it sometimes, but typically they're going to sell for less than that, no matter what the multiple is, three times, five times, 10 times. Typically, it's close to that one-time gross figure. And so that $5 million would be the good mark. $5 million and very profitable um, would kind of be where I would be shooting for. Um, you know, that's going to put you somewhere in the $700,000 of profitability range, I would think, um, depending on how well you run. And, um, you know, at a 12 to 15 percent net margin. So six million in sales. And once again, as that sales figure starts going up, profitability starts coming down. So I hope my vague answer gave you at least some some insight of, 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 of answering that question. It's just it's challenging to say this is definitively what it is. Uh, a, another common thing I hear is um, 500 to um 500 to 1,000 maintenance agreements for per million dollars of gross sales. So another KPI to look at is, so if you're doing 5 million in shale sales, 2,500 maintenance agreements is another thing to be shooting for. I think I think 1,000 per million is, is kind of hard. I don't see a lot of companies achieving that, um, but 500 is certainly doable. So hopefully that answers the question. All right, let's try to get through, um, we got a few more questions in, in here, but and typically we end these at the 45 minute mark. Let's try to get through a, one or two of these real quickly. Um, Jeff asked on average, what is the typical cash flow threshold where the sale multiple goes up closer to the high end of the range you mentioned? Yeah, so so that 500,000 figure is, is really a key moving point. It seems when they get above 500,000, you start getting more private equity interest, which creates more demand and it starts going up. That 500 to a million dollars in seller discretionary earnings, that ramps up quickly. Okay, and then um, Andrew, can you recommend a resource for building good service agreement plans, terms, so that we can sell more? Can I recommend, I'm sorry, I, I lost you. Do you have a, I, yeah, so do you have um, like any sort of recommendation for where people can find out how to build good service agreement plans? Yeah, there's there's quite a few coaching programs out there. I mean, you know, Service Roundtable offers programs, Nexstar offers programs. Um, 
uh, service. Oh my goodness, and I can't I can't believe I can't think of his name off the top of my head. Um, I'll I'll put it in the notes for afterwards. There's a gentleman uh, from England. Um, oh my goodness, I'm having a brain freeze. That has a great. Pro you know, who teaches different programs and be able to find something. Um, okay. So I, yeah, I, I think we got a lot of great questions. Um, Patrick, how do people get in touch with you? Uh, and then can you talk more about how you work with buyers and sellers? Yeah, absolutely. So reach out to me I'm on the screen. There's my email, my, it's my cell phone number. Call me, text me. I'm happy to answer any questions. I know we're running out of time here and there's still questions. If we didn't answer your question, send me an email. I'm happy to answer it or give me a call. I'm happy to answer it. My website, businessmodificationgroup.com. I've got a YouTube channel. Uh, look me up. You'll see two of them. There's one that's a real fit guy who runs marathons. That's not me. That's a different patch of land. <laughs> You find a fat guy in the woods talking about buying and selling heating and air companies and you'll get that. That'll be the right YouTube channel. Um, but um, I'm, I'm active on Facebook. I'm active on LinkedIn. Um, reach out to me on any of those platforms. I, I really I want to be able to help people because it helps the industry. And, and then, heck, when you when you want to sell five years from now and your business is better and you come work for me, it helps me, too. So so we're all on the same page with that. So don't hesitate. Any questions that we that I didn't answer, reach out to me. I'm happy to answer them for you. But that's that's where I go. Connect with me on LinkedIn, Facebook, my uh, YouTube, subscribe to my YouTube channel, and then reach out to me directly. Awesome. And Patrick, it was great having you on here today. It, it seems like everyone enjoyed your content. I can't wait to have you on for another session in 2024 or early 2024. So um, really appreciate your time. Also, for for those of you that don't use Workies, as you heard today, having a CRM very important to getting getting a good sale sale price. So um, feel free to reach out to Workies to get set up. Uh, Patrick, again, thank you so much for joining. Uh, any final words for everyone? No, I appreciate everybody taking time out of their day. Obviously, in the middle of the afternoon, you're stopping what you're doing to participate in this. So thank you. And please don't hesitate to reach out. I, I mean that. I'm happy to answer any questions that I have. Most people don't know where to go to get the answers. And I was most people. I've sold my own business, so I understand. So don't hesitate to reach out. Awesome. And then for those of you guys that missed the first part or want to watch it again, just go to this uh, same link you used to join today and the recording will be available probably within a minute or so. Uh, we also have webinars, our previous webinars and future webinars on workies.com. So uh, there's a library of webinars that this will also be uploaded to within a few days, I would imagine. Uh, but again, thank you all for joining and thanks for the great questions. And Patrick, thanks for taking your time today and uh, giving people some insights. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate it. I hope people got value out of it. Awesome. And until next time, uh, cheers. Thank you so much.